Well, there's this group called Pink Floyd. Uh, what? Pink what? The only time I saw Sid Barrett was when he popped into the Abbey Road session when we were doing Atom Heart Mother and he kind of spun round a couple of times <laughs> in slow motion and then went out again and that was about it. That's all I ever saw of him. He'd gone. He was still looking the same, but he was somewhere else. We carried on two musical careers at the same time. If we took um, Interstellar Overdrive outside London, people hated it. The hand thing, you know, my hands felt like two balloons. Is that's from being delirious as a child. But this tell us this like everything receding. There is no pain. You are receding. It happened to me, and so and it came back slowly as I sat and played at the piano. But I remember thinking, Good God, you know, it's this is a fine line I'm walking here. One bit of riff from another bit of riff. It's, you know, there's hundreds of different ways you can do something. Some have a little bit of magic to them. And the ones that do have that bit of magic to them, it's obvious, you know, to people around. They, even just that piece of music has an emotional pull to it. That's what we're struggling to find all the time. Pink Floyd grew from friendships forged in the 1960s in the university town of Cambridge. Britain was then in the grip of psychedelia and the hippie scene as well. Popular music was undergoing a huge transformation and the young Sid Barrett was wide open to the wall. He was expressing all the bricks and the wall were all the things in his life that had upset him or uh, made him the way he was. That was the thing that, that they played on. I think this was largely from Roger's sense of alienation. He was, a, he was an uneasy pop star, I think it was fair to say. And he had sort of doubts about his role in some ways, you know, none at all in others. Rising tensions between Roger Waters and Rick Wright led to the keyboard player being sacked. None of them had made any money from The Wall. The Wall had been such an expensive production. The only person, ironically, who made any money was Rick Wright, the original keyboards player, who had been involved in the production of The Wall, or wanted to be involved in the production of The Wall, but allegedly was not very active in that role. And, and Roger Waters had demanded that he be fired from the group. Then they realised that they haven't got anyone to play keyboards on the stage, so they get him back in on a wage. So, in fact, he is actually the only member of Pink Floyd uh, to make any money out of the wall. The live shows which promoted the album were an unforgettable experience. Ambitious in their scope and their staging, Waters' themes of alienation and separation took physical form with the creation of a real wall. I remember going to see the show at the Earl's Court in London and watching the slow process of building the brick wall which goes on throughout the entire show, gradually laying this line of bricks and you think, what are they doing? How's it all going to resolve? And of course, gradually the band disappear behind the, the huge barrier uh, and then the final moments, the whole lot is destroyed and smashed to pieces. When, when Roger realises that maybe it's not a good idea, psychologically speaking, to have a a mental barrier inside your head. When I think back, I think, wow, that was quite a big show. And, I, and it's very impressive that Roger could actually put that sort of thing together, technically, to make it work, building the wall and knocking it down. Written into the structure of the show was the nature of what they termed the surrogate band. So, for instance, the show opens with uh, a thing that is largely instrumental. It's a, certainly a big, bombastic instrumental opening. Then the light goes down, at the end of the song, the bands freeze the image. The, um, a, a Lancaster bomber or something flies over the head of the crowd. The lights come up on a stage that's higher than the stage that they've just seen the Pink Floyd play the opening number. And there on the higher stage is Pink Floyd playing the second number. So it's like, hang on, you know, that was Pink Floyd down there. And that was the illusion that they constantly played on. And they used what they termed the surrogate band, which was myself, Andy Baum, Willie Wilson, and Pete Wood, um, as the surrogates. And we were given latex masks and made to look exactly like Pink Floyd. General Scarf, as I understand it, created the whole 
show entirely from the, the the visuals to the animatronics to the staging of it you know that that was his vision more than Roger Waters is massive puppets the things that were sort of you know 30 foot high and uh, string puppets that would walk across the stage that the school teacher for another brick in the wall was this giant puppet with car headlights for eyes it's a big show and the musicians are just one you know, a few small cogs in a big machine, there's a lot more going on, and you just make sure you get your part right. Any note that Pink Floyd could have played live was played live. I mean, that was the bottom line, basically. Um, musically, the orchestral pieces and things like the children's voices in Another Brick, you know, we don't need no education, that stuff uh, was pre-recorded, that was on tape. So it all had to be basically played in time. It was all linked into special effects and click tracks and you know film and that so everything had to be down to the last second most of the time. The basic um, uh, structure of the whole of the first half of the show was the building of the wall up to the point where the final brick goes in and suddenly the house lights come up and the audience realizes that this vast structure you know it suddenly hits them by god Look at that, you know, this is 150 foot across, 60 foot high, whatever it was, you know, this is vast structure has just been built in 45 minutes. But in order to get to that point, there was a, a piece of music built in just before the Goodbye Cruel World, where David and I would just trade riffs to give the wall builders time to get those last bricks in. Some nights it was slow, some nights, you know, they really had to move fast and we would play for three or four minutes. When we got the tear down the wall section, I was standing inside a cage on stage behind the wall as the wall came down. And inside the cage with me were roadies who were holding the cage up as these bricks were hammering down on it. And I was playing the guitar riff for the tear down the wall section. And it was unbelievable. And, and you would have a countdown on the monitors as to when the first bricks were going to come. Because if you didn't have that warning, you would just you know, you just stopped playing, it was so frightening. I think the legend of that show has built up because there's such a tremendous cachet to having been there and to having experienced it because, you know, it wasn't this vast touring circus that went around the world for three years. It's 29 shows, four locations, that's it, you know, see you later. And I knew that there were tensions in the band. Very interestingly, backstage at Earl's Court, there were four caravans in a sort of square and three of them faced into the middle of the square. Rogers faced the other way. So he didn't socialize with us. He never came to the bar in, in uh, Dusseldorf. The other three were always there after the gig, you know, a few scoops, chats, and whether it was going well and what could be better. And you know, those things that anybody would talk about after a gig, but you never saw Roger. It was very much a swan song. I mean, the thing was sort of corroding, really. Alan Parker was going to shoot a concert movie and there were going to be dramatic highlights cut in with the story that became ultimately the story of the entire movie, the, the thing with Geldof and, you know, the no eyebrows character and Pink, you know, who was just a big rag doll in, in our show. And then they just jettisoned the notion of the concert at all. But they filmed every night at Earl's Court for five nights, multi-camera shoot, I mean, people everywhere. Well, some people have called uh, uh, The Wall, the movie, which came out in 1982, directed by Alan Parker, um, uh, a one huge clip. In other words, um, lots of repetition and uh, not really focused as a movie. My overwhelming feeling really was of disappointment. I hoped it was going to be a concert movie, and I didn't really know that it wasn't until I went to see the film. And I, the other thing was that I thought it was a shame that they didn't... Uh, make more of the music. They used the album, just remixed bits of the album, rather than actually approach it again from scratch. The, the bigger criticism I would make is is that the movie itself, if you compare it with a, with another album that made it onto the big screen, like the Who's Tommy, um, there's 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 a lack of humour really and self-parody. It's all very, very intense. I mean, it is all on one level uh, and it is very extreme, but I guess it had to be, you know, that, that, was, that was the wall, you know, that was the concept. The wall always repays the listener with new insights into an amazing creation, a magnificent achievement which stretches the horizons of Pink Floyd's musical scope to include a worldwide hit single, an ingenious Gilbert and Sullivan pastiche, and two genuine highlights from the Floyd repertoire, Run Like Hell and Comfortably Numb. 
David Gilmour came up with the song Comfortably Numb. The fact that it did sneak onto the album, <laughs> if, if indeed that was the case, was, um, was, was, was of great credit to, to Dave Gilmour, really. Um, because obviously, to interrupt Roger Waters' is, you know, tunnel vision about that record was uh, uh, an amazing thing in itself. But in a strange kind of way, it's almost like their greatest hits album because you've got these much shorter, tighter pieces of writing, much more controlled. It's, uh, it's less of the very long, expansive uh, Dark Side of the Moon sort of a continuous um, saga. It gave them the chance to produce hit singles, which took everybody by surprise. As far as the strength of the music is concerned with, with The Wall, obviously with, with tracks like Comfortably Numb and uh, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, you, you, can't, you can't say it's anything but strong. Um, I think the strange thing is that, that The Wall to me does sound a little bit like a soundtrack album. I think when you initially bought that album, you felt that it wasn't quite a whole in itself. It was just it was it was an element, and you needed to to, to bolt on the other bits and pieces to get the full Floyd experience. With the departure of Richard Wright, Pink Floyd began the 80s as a three-piece with Roger Waters as the real power in the band. This disproportionate split of control was evident in the next album, The Final Cut, released back in March 1983. The overriding impression from this ill-favoured outing is one of a Roger Waters solo album. The credits tell you very categorically that this is a Roger Waters work. And uh, the fact that he didn't really involve the others really showed his disinterest in keeping the group going. The final cut dwells on the politics and social landscape of Britain in the early 1980s. The focus is incredibly narrow and could almost be lifted from an editorial meeting of The Guardian, Roger's newspaper of choice. The atmosphere of the album is relentlessly downbeat, and with no melodic or instrumental relief, the darkness and bitterness are overwhelming. What is different is that, that Bob Ezrin had been dismissed from the camp because he'd, he had inadvertently told an American journalist that, uh, that the, the finale of the Wall stage show would involve it basically being demolished. So he's replaced by Michael Kamen, who's capable, who's a great catalyst. He's one of those people who can bring everyone together. And his energy in the studio on Final Cut was very important. So. You could imagine, I mean, if he's such an up figure, you could imagine it could have been a lot even more down than it already is if he hadn't been there. Pink Floyd never toured with the final cut, really, because I think no one wanted to tour. Uh, particularly Roger Waters didn't want to tour. He really seemed to want to get out of the whole thing at that point. There is a strong feeling that we are revisiting exactly the same thematic landscape as the war, with its exploration of the damaging effect of the sacrifices made in war, we are very much stuck in the same territory. Well, if you look at something, you know, a piece, a piece of music like The Wall, you're hardly going to better that. So everything's going to be downhill from there, no matter what you try, at least for a, a short, short period of time. So when you bring something out like the final cut, I think you've got to look at it in that context. Um, and I think it's done that he would no longer be recording with Pink Floyd. Waters clearly felt that this manoeuvre would signal the end of the group. Rogers saw it as the final cut, you know, that's, that's the title, it's, it's the end of Floyd, and he probably thought that's what was going to happen, but of course it wasn't. He's absolutely shocked when he learns that uh, the other two members, as they then were, uh, Dave Gilmore and Nick Mason, intend to carry on with the group's name. But he only learns this when he essentially issues them with legal papers saying, that the group is to be disbanded and the name is to exist no to more. The final cut. Despite everything Waters could throw at him, Gilmore and Mason emerged victorious. They had won the right to use the Pink Floyd name, and in a further calculated snub to Waters, they hooked up again with Richard Wright and produced a new album, backed by a huge world tour. For legal and tax reasons, Richard Wright was not officially a full member of the band again. Despite the fact that he was a founder member, legally Floyd were now a duo with a hired keyboard player on wages. The album which emerged was entitled A Momentary Lapse of Reason, 
and demonstrated there was still plenty of life in the band, even without Waters. I think Momentary Lapse of Reason was a fantastic rebirth of the band. Oh, Momentary Lapse of Reason certainly did breathe new life into the group. I mean, it, it got them up and running again on, a, on actually a much larger scale than previously. There was a huge appetite for Pink Floyd's music and a colossal amount of goodwill. The fans really wanted something which sounded like the Floyd of old. And sensing the mood, David Gilmour was able to produce an album which just about passed muster, although the estranged Roger Waters notoriously dismissed the album as a facsimile of the Floyd sound. I think it was a sort of a, it was, well, it's obviously made very much in, 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 the, in the Pink Floyd style, but um, I think really it was a sort of a transition for, for David, who was very much at the helm of, of, of particularly at that point. Um, of doing it. it. It was a kind of solo album, I'm sure you wouldn't mind me saying so really, in, in, in a way, but obviously including the other guys in, in the band, but because there'd been, I don't know, seven, eight years, whatever, it had elapsed since they'd done anything, it was kind of a, very much kind of a fresh take on, on the Floyd. Bob Ezrin is brought back for momentary lapse of reason. Obviously, you know, Roger Waters is no longer around, so there's no problem. And he's, you know, he's a proven commodity. It's been proven he works. He's almost second to none as a producer anyway. And I, and I think it's the, the results speak for themselves. Pink Floyd began an enormous trek around the stadiums of Europe and North America, playing to huge crowds, which easily eclipsed the thin crowds which attended Waters' solo tour. I, by chance, got asked to do Roger Waters' first solo tour. The pros and cons of hitchhiking. So I'd, I'd done that, and um, I suppose that kind of put me in, in a bit of a you know kind of who should we get to play rhythm guitar? Ah, oh, he seems to be all right, you know. So I eventually got a call to do that, much to my surprise. I think David rang me personally to start with. That was the very first sort of introduction to it, just to see you know whether I'd like to be involved. And um, obviously, you know, it sounds like a fantastic idea. And it, initially, it was, I believe, planned to just go out for a, a number of weeks just in America. And they weren't really quite sure how it was going to all go, but it very quickly became apparent that um, there was a lot of demand for it. So it, came, it, it changed from a sort of a few weeks in America to what, what ended up as 16 months all around the world twice, basically. Um, so it was, a, it was a quite a huge, life-changing thing. <laughs> There was great sort of cam camaraderie within the band. We all, you know, we all got on instantly very well. Um, but it was very good, very, very friendly, balanced with people. You know. At the beginning of the tour, we, we performed the, the new numbers from the Momentary Lapse of Reason. And it hadn't really been released. In fact, I think when we, when we started, I think the album, had, I don't know if it was actually released. I think we played just the first few gigs and the, the, the album wasn't actually out. So it was playing, you know, people just didn't recognise this stuff at all. I mean, given that, the response was fantastic, really. We basically tried to keep it to, the, to, to numbers, obviously, that David was more associated with, and that sang and contributed to the writing of. So that sort of narrowed it down a fair bit. It's the best period for Pink Floyd Live that I have ever seen. It went down so well, I'm, I'm pretty sure, because um, most of the public didn't really expect to ever see Pink Floyd playing anything. So it was kind of a, you know, from out of nowhere comes Oh, this band we didn't think we'd ever see. And, and in the past, they'd been very, very difficult to, to catch live. So suddenly it became kind of available, you know, in your town, you know. Um, and particularly in America, I mean, the response was fantastic before playing a note, you know. Uh, a great deal of excitement and anticipation and stuff going on. The Division Bell, released in April 1994, was an altogether superior effort. Careful, studied and mannered, the album flows together as a suite of songs. There are no dramatic dynamic peaks and troughs or extremes of tempo, but the smooth majestic flow of the music worked its magic on audiences on both sides of the Atlantic. And for the first time in history, Pink Floyd had an album which went to number one in both Britain and America. I love the division bell. I just think it's classic Floyd, completely. You know, you don't have necessarily the angry side um, of, of earlier Floyd. Nick Mason and Rick Wright were now fully functional and part of the team. But with Dave Gilmore not being a dab hand at writing lyrics, he enlisted the help of his wife-to-be Polly Samson and also Nick Laird Clues of the Dream Academy to help him. 
Together with other collaborators, the songwriting tended to be a little diluted compared with previous efforts, where Momentary Lapse of Reason had perhaps been a collection of songs that he'd been unable to use in the previous Pink Floyd lineup. Cluster One is a great example of exactly how good this band could still be 30 years after its birth. <laughs> The tour which supported the album was also something of a triumph. It featured an even better and more advanced light show than anything which had gone before. And Pulse, the live album taken from the tour, beautifully captured what was certainly a career highlight for Pink Floyd. Richard Wright was also back in the fold and as a full member of Pink Floyd. In many respects, it seemed as if the band had reached the limits of its creativity and in fact its commercial success there was almost nowhere else to go. Following the death of long-term manager Steve O'Rourke, David Gilmour announced to the world that he felt disinclined to continue to carry the weight of the Floyd juggernaut upon his shoulders. If there ever was a good example of the old adage that it's best to quit at the top, then this was it. Pink Floyd bowed out of the recording studio in 1994 with a magnificent best-selling album a gigantic, awe-inspiring live show, a wonderful musical legacy, and an unmatched reputation for excellence, all left blissfully intact with no sad decline into mediocrity to taint the brilliance. <laughs> <laughs>